This is Bavaria, the capital, the ancient capital of Germany for many, many years. In this area of the world, there was a prestigious institution of learning controlled by the Jesuits called Ingolstadt University. Prestigious Jesuits were graduated from this university to go out and to deceive the world. Among the um, publications that we found there in the museum was a picture of a man by the name of Adam Weishaupt. He was a German Jew by blood, but he was also a Jesuit and he was a dabbler in the occult arts. He was a genius and at an early age he became a doctor to canon law. He wrote the, and published in 1776 the Illuminati, the writings for a basis for a communist world. Proofs of this are given in a book called Proofs of Conspiracy by Robeson, 1798. It was sent out in hopes by this man who had been drawn into the organization in hopes of warning the world against the dangers of this worldwide revolution. He says in that book that Weishaupt had long been scheming the establishment of an association or order which in time should govern the whole world. In his first fervor and high expectation, he hinted to several ex-Jesuits the probability of their recovering under a new name the influence which they formerly possessed. And remember, they had been dissolved in 1773. The influence which they formerly possessed and of being again of great service to society by directing the education of youth of distinction now emancipated from all civil and religious prejudices. So Weishaupt approached Jesuits and Jesuits, though they had been secularized, they laid the foundation for another great society and I believe this is a branch of the Jesuit order. I still feel today that they have a strong connection in the Illuminati. They taught that Jesus of Nazareth was the grand master of their order, that he appeared at the time when the world was in utmost disorder and among a people who for ages had grown under the yoke of bondage. He taught them the lessons of reason. To be more effective, he took in the aid of religion, of opinions which were current. And in a very clever manner, he combined his secret doctrines with the popular religion and with the customs which lay to his hand. He concealed the precious meaning and consequences of his doctrines, but fully disclosed them to the chosen few. In other words, Jesus is the master of the secret societies. And uh, he taught that the world would be brought into a state of liberty and moral equality. They taught a natural goodness in every man. Once men are freed from the obstacles which subordinate rank and riches, and they add to that all churches and all governments must be taken out of the way that these things continually thrown in our way, our secret association, they say, will work in a way that nothing can withstand and man shall soon be free. And of course, since it was patterned after the Jesuit order, it was a system that would never be destroyed because it was even more secret than the secret workings of the Jesuit order. And Adam Weishaupt designed this symbol, Annuit Coeptus Novus Order Seclorum, our noble enterprise, a new world order. And uh, you'll see that today the concept of the Illuminati is joked about, but you'll find fantasy games about the Illuminati, books on the Illuminati, as people have grown to accept the concept in the new age that we're in today. Adam Weishaupt adopted that symbol that now resides on your dollar bill from a picture of the pagan Catholic god that resided on the altarpieces in Ingolstadt and Bavaria. The significance of this design is as follows. The pyramid represents a conspiracy for the destruction of the universal church, Catholic church, and establishment of a one world or UN dictatorship. You see, this new order will even remove the Roman church. It's an occult order now. The secret of the order, the eye radiating in all directions, is the all-spying eye that symbolizes the terroristic Gestapo-like espionage agency that Weishaupt set up under the name of the insinuating brethren to guard the secret of the order and to terrorize the populace into acceptance of its rule. This Agfu had its first workout in the reign of terror of the French Revolution, which it was instrumental in organizing. So Weishaupt's Illuminati, Weishaupt's name was the father of Jacobinism. The Jacobins took over the French government. They were responsible for the reign of terror. That was their symbol. And now look what Ellen White has to say. She says in Great Controversy, page 273, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. The atheistical power that ruled in France during the revolution, the reign of terror, did wage such a war against God and his holy word as the world has never witnessed. This is the spirit of God telling us that the Illuminati is in fact the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. 
It should be noted that this insignia acquired Masonic significance only after the merger of that order with the Order of, Will, uh, order of the Illuminati at the Congress of Wilhelmsbad in 1782. So the Order of Illuminism, Luciferianism, nowadays called the Palladium, is a secret society within the high-ranking Masonic lodges. And uh, 1782, you realize that uh, it was a few years later, 1789, that the revolution broke out in France. But this was a symbol of the revolution in France. Looks familiar, doesn't it? And you'll see this all over. We know that Voltaire, the atheist that he was, was educated in a Jesuit seminary. And this is the grave of Rousseau there in France today. All these men were hired by an elite group of Jewish bankers to, to carry out this great revolution. Robespierre. When the revolution broke out, they destroyed the flower of the nation. Priests uh, came to the great uh, National Assembly and, um, and gave up their priesthood in the Roman Church and accepted this new priesthood of the goddess of reason. The Bible, of course, was outlawed in that assembly. It was, uh, and God was declared non-existent the first time in the history of the world that anything like this had happened. But don't think for a minute that there wasn't a belief in the supernatural. No, whenever atheism comes, the belief in the uh, supernatural rises. And in the court of Louis XVI, there were astrologers and astronomers, the great Cagliostro, uh, a mason and a devil worshiper, did his magic in the courts there. So you'll find the ascendancy of psychic and supernatural activity when they do away with religion. But even this man, a high-ranking mason and a member of the Illuminati in the height of the revolution was, was butchered when he tried to flee the country. They couldn't even control it once it let go. And that's the same way it's going to happen at the end of time. There'll be slaughter from one end of the earth to the other. When we went into the Communist uh, Museum in East Berlin on the history of communism, the first uh, the display we walked into was on the French Revolution as the beginning of communism, 1789. So here is your beginning of communism. The word commune came from the, it was a French word for how the French lived, the houses around a court. Commune, communism. When the, uh, Napoleon tried to set up a Holy Roman Empire, he refused to acknowledge the Pope as the head of it, rather placing the crown on his own head. In this way, through the work of the the uh, Napoleon, his troops, Berthier, that went down into uh, Rome, the Pope lost his ecclesiastical power. And the prophecy of God, the 1260 days, were perfectly fulfilled at that time. You see, these things are essential to our understanding of prophecy, to understand the history of these things. Following uh, uh, Weishaupt, a man took over the inside of the secret societies to lead out in world revolution by the name of Mazzini. Mazzini was a genius, and very few of us can comprehend the type of minds these men had, photostatic memories who had great capacity. They were devil worshippers, so they had spirits working in them to give them amazing talents and ability. Now, res research dug up letters from Mazzini, which revealed how the high priests of the Luciferian creed keep their identity and true purpose secret. In a letter Mazzini wrote to his revolutionary associate, Dr. Bernstein, only a few years before he died, he said this, we form an association of brothers in all points of the globe. Now that's an admission documented that their secret society is universal. We wish to break every yoke. Their, their goal is to destroy all governments. Yet there is one unseen. There's a yoke unseen that we can hardly feel. Yet it weighs on us. Where is it coming from? Where is it? We don't know. Nobody knows, or at least nobody tells, because this association is secret even to us, the veterans of the secret societies. What might that secret society be? You see? The secret society, I believe, that spawned it, the Jesuit order, is there. And uh, this man wrote fluently and spoke fluently in 16 languages. He was the world-renowned scholar on occult and devil worship in his time. He became the grand, great master of, of masonry. He was called the Pope of Masonry in the United States. Mazzini brought him in, and they established both a satanic uh, cult and also a Luciferian um, secret society for the 32nd and 33 degree Masons. So this is documentation of that letter to the Palladium. This is what Albert Pike called it. 
That which we say to the crowd is we worship God, but it is the God that one worships without superstition. The religion should be by all us initiates of the high degrees maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately Adonai is God also, for the absolute can exist only as two gods. The concept of good and evil, like from Babylon. Thus the doctrine of Satanism is a heresy. They believe that the teaching of who Satan was created by the church is false. And the true and pure philosophical religion is a belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai, and that's the one they call the God of the Christians. But Lucifer, God of light, God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. And they teach that uh, this God of evil, this God of the dark forces, which the entire world must now move into uh, a state of mind, through transition of mind to repel, will be coming from, through the corridors of Orion very soon. And the world must be all occult to repel it. This is move, these are movements taking place today in the New Age movement. We shall unleash the nihilist, the atheist, and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm which in all its horrors will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization, the multitude's dissolution with Christianity, anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer. Finally, out in public view, a manifestation will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity atheism both conquered and exterminated at the same time. He laid out a plan that this would take place in three world wars. The last world war would result in Palestine, and this was Pike's plan. Listen, this was Pike's plan before the turn of the century. Last war would be, uh, the third world war, they said, would be to raise up the power of the Arab nations and the power of Palestine get the entire world on one side or the other, and then bring about incidents for an international destruction. That was their plan before the turn of the century. This is an example of one of these types of characters. This is Aleister Crowley, and uh, here you see he was a 33rd, 90, 95 degree Mason. I don't know what that means, I'll tell you. He was uh, one of the highest rank in Rosicrucians in his time he took out the charter in San Jose. And uh, we also know that he was a high ranking um, initiate in what was called the Golden Dawn or the Jewish ca Kabbalism that was set up for the elite in England. And this is the law that he established. And it goes something like this, the law of the strong, this is our law in the joy of the world. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And at the end of it he says, man has a right to kill those who would thwart these rights, the slave shall serve. And these people believe this in these societies. There's no doubt about it because of the way they're working, it's very, very evident. In Nesta Webster's book, Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, she, as a, uh, a Christian, drawing from Christian sources, viewed the Jews as responsible for this. Now, it's true that there were, there were Jews involved in it, but by far it wasn't all Jews. In fact, those who had established the international banking system that financed most of this were not even blood Jews. They were called Khazar Jews. They were uh, Northern Europeans that had... Um, Northeastern Europeans that had converted to Judaism on the surface. But this is Amshal Meyer. He was the father of a family that uh, became international bankers. He sent sons to the different nations of Europe. Those sons financed every part of the revolution and uh, for those governments, and then when the economies of Europe began to collapse, the people had to turn to these people that they had borrowed their money from, and they turned over the control of their economy to these men. They still they still have a tremendous amount of control in the world today. Again, back to my little book, The Fiery Jesuits from, the, from Pacific Union College. There it describes that the Jesuits were given authority over banking by the Roman Catholic Church. They took a vow to become the Jews among the Jews and enter into the world of banking and business. As uh, finance is really the power in this world and the Roman Church has the largest amount of gold of any organization, it's pretty clear that although we might see a facade of Zionism or a facade of Illuminism, behind it is the financial dynasty of 15 hundred years of grasping the wealth of the world by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, uh, working closely with the Satanist uh, Luciferian Mazzini was a man by the name of Karl Marx. Marx was not prominent in the secret society, but he and Engels were used to lay out the ideology of the communists to be used to start a revolution throughout the world. Following him, of course, Lenin picked it up. 
Lenin was a brilliant genius, no doubt about it. He studied in London where most of these men were trained. And this is a plan that he laid out in 1917. The first thing was to secure the western borders through a takeover of the Baltic states and so on, and that was happened during the Second World War finally. But remember, 1917 was when it was planned. Gain control of the Far East through subversive attacks on Korea, Vietnam, Indonesia, and so on, and that's why we had trouble in Korea and Vietnam. It was Lenin's plan back in 1917. Gain control of Africa, the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, and all the waterways, and just before I came over here, there was a great big blow up as it appears that Panama is turning to the communists. And we may lose that waterway now too, as, as the Suez Canal and all these others. That was Lenin's plan. Gradually subject all of Latin America into communist rule beginning with Cuba. Why Cuba? It was Lenin's plan. Once Russia has exercised control of the world, take over the United States when she is outgunned and completely surrounded. And we have a terrible thing developing now in the government of Mexico. Just before I left home, the government invited a Russian warship to come into their harbor in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, this is a, is a portent for a dangerous situation where Mexico will become a revolutionary force and our borders, then you see, would become surrounded. The revulsion by the Buddhists of the, of the terror of Catholic persecution of these poor people created the horrible situation in Vietnam. Those priests and, and nuns that were burning themselves to death there were not doing it to re, against communism. They were doing it against a government that was controlled by the Roman papacy, uh, backed by the United States, and suppressing all other religions in that community. When we look at what happened in Vietnam, we see clearly the involvement of Catholicism and the Jesuits working to confuse and destroy the world. This was Stalin's intermediate goal, which was to confuse, disorganize, and destroy the forces of capitalism around the world. Bring all nations together into a single world system of economy, force the advanced countries to pour a prolonged financial aid into the underdeveloped countries, and then divide the world into regions, such as the regions we have right now, in preparation for coming into a dictatorship of the UN. And we can see things moving along very well. The United States is almost always voted against in the UN by the third world countries today. The growth of communism, its spread today has been so phenomenal that those who refuse to acknowledge that it is a part of revelation and biblical prophecy are, are hiding their heads in the sand and prophecy is passing them right by. On January 4, 1864, Ellen White was shown that Lincoln's administration, that before Lincoln's administration, the former administration had been planned and managed for the South to rob the North of their implements of war. They were contemplating a determined rebellion. The North did not understand the bitter, dreadful hatred of the South towards them and were unprepared for the deep laid plot. So it was a conspiracy in the United States years before the war broke out by the papacy-controlled South to take the, uh, I was going to say this country over, I'm sorry, I forgot where I was, to take over the United States. And uh, in taking over the United States, they will inevitably take over the entire civilized world. They know that. In the book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Chiniqui, he documents here, his lawyer was Abraham Lincoln to defend him in a court case. Here's the bill that Lincoln wrote out, $50. Anyway, when Lincoln became president, uh, he made these statements to Father Chiniqui, who became, uh, it was during the time we were to give our message to the world, and he was traveling all over, warning the world that uh, Catholicism was Babylon. But this is what Lincoln said. Unfortunately, I feel more and more every day that it is not against the Americans of the South alone I am fighting. It is more against the Pope of Rome, his perfidious Jesuits, and the blind and bloodthirsty slaves. And this is quoted from Abraham Lincoln. I have a lot more on this, but I can only give a few excerpts from this talk. Is it not an absurdity, says Lincoln, to give to a man a thing which he has sworn to hate, curse, and destroy? And does not the Church of Rome hate, curse, and destroy liberty of conscience whenever she can do it safely? I cannot give liberty of conscience to the Pope and to his followers, the papists, so long as they tell me through all their councils, theologians, and canon laws that their conscience orders them to burn my wife, strangle my children, and cut my throat when they find their opportunity. You'll find out the war between the states was a religious war, but this was kept from the media. Abraham Lincoln said, the best, the leading families of the South have received their education in great part, if not in whole, from the Jesuits and the nuns, hence those degrading principles of slavery, pride, and cruelty. And Ellen White says that slavery is going to return in the South. President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by the priests and the Jesuits of Rome. Booth was nothing but a tool of the Jesuits, says, uh, uh, says Chiniqui, after he went over the court cases, and it was all came out in the court cases. I'm going to skip this slide. 
Um, he compares the mind of Booth with the mind of a Jesuit, Ravalek, uh, when that man was uh, put to death. And both had the same mind, said very similar things. But when we look at these faces, we're looking at the faces of men who have been impressed and controlled by the Jesuit order to carry out a plot to destroy, I believe, one of the greatest presidents the United States ever had. That Vatican tried to work over the turn of the centuries. They impose approached the monarchies of Europe, they approached Bismarck, they approached Kaiser Wilhelm. Their effort was to get these men to become the arm of the papacy to regain the lost uh, Roman Empire for her. That first world war was fought because of the persecution of the uh, Catholic Church of the Serbian Orthodox people and their revulsion of her and then they killed uh, Ferdinand. They shot him. It was a local incident. It had, there was no reason for the world to get involved in war over that but the fact was that the way they can control the media and the influences they have throughout the world they created it into one of the most horrible wars that has ever been known to man. Again, uh, this is Pius the 11th. Uh, he was a pope that was determined to bring about a war to reconquer the world. So he, uh, this book, Secret History of the Jesuits by Chick Publications, if you can get it, it documents everything I'm going to say here uh, to you about the Second World War. Mussolini was a Satanist. When he came into the presence of the pope, he made all the hand signs to protect himself from what he knew the pope was. And I think that's a real admission on the part of the Satanists, knowing who the Pope is. But anyway, uh, Mussolini was raised to power politically because of the support of the papacy. And because of that, he gave the papacy a tremendous amount of money. As well, he gave them uh, political control of a territory in Italy again in the Lateran Treaty, 1929. This was the beginning of the healing of the deadly wound, not the healing, folks. The healing of the deadly wound will be complete at the Sunday law. In this book written during those years called The Destruction of Freemasonry in Germany by General Erich Ludendorff, this man reveals what was taking place in court cases there where they showed that in the Masonic lodges there were plans being laid for a war in Germany. Now I believe that every time the Catholic Church begins to move, watch the movements of the occult at the same time and you'll see they'll rise and work together. Maybe they'll appear to be opposing each other, but they'll always be working together. Here in the Masonic, the Satanic Lodges, I believe this is Satan worship from beginning to end. In the Masonic Lodges, they were planning a war at the same time that Mussolini and Hitler were being raised up by the papacy, you see, to be the instruments of it. So they were working hand in hand. The symbols of Hitler were symbols that came off uh, altars of the Roman papacy at that time. This is, uh, this is uh, Pacelli. He was nuncio to Bavaria. And there in contact with, uh, with the Third Reich, the church in 1933 signed a concordat uniting the interests of the Third Reich and the papacy. Hitler, the little house painter that he was, and a little bit emotional, he was made into a god by the Jesuit priests who were stationed around him. This is the little boy Hitler standing there in his classroom and where he went to school in the Catholic school. And right over the door in the Catholic school was a great big swastika in the Catholic school. This is Hitler in prison. You can tell that by this time he's deep into the occult. He's a possessed man. But he's surrounded by Jesuit priests and that tells you a lot too. The church alone was capable of bringing in power. The occult could never do it, and they knew that. But he continued to push occult teachings in the Aryan uh, concept of the New Age above uh, many of the interests of the church, which created a, a, a surface division. But at the same time, Hitler was rising to power. We go back and we look at what was taking place during that war in the occult, and we see the IG Farben complex, the largest drug uh, dealer in the world, medical drugs, united their interests with the Rockefeller dynasty, which went clear back to the Rothschilds and formed the largest cartel in history. It was this financial dynasty that was able to bring Hitler to power. Hitler's rise to power would have been impossible without the secret financial support of I.G. Farben. The Nazi state became the means by which the cartel agreements were enforced. And just a little word, and I'd love to have a whole slide program on the history of the AMA. But the AMA rose out of that satanic cartel to push drug medicines so that this financial dynasty would have a means of dealing it to the populaces of the world. They made more money on cancer than they have anything else. 
Hitler himself stated, I learned much from the order of the Jesuits until now there has never been anything more grandiose on the earth than the hierarchical organization of the Catholic Church. I transferred much of this organization into my own party and then I have a book I was going to bring it and read it at this point but it says that that the Jesuit the order of the Jesuits every bit of it was uh, taken into the the um, the SS troops I mean it was identical to it they copied everything from the Jesuits uh oh went past this uh, fellow here Himmler's uncle was a Jesuit in the courts of Bavaria. He was released by the church and sent down in SS clothing to counsel him all the way through his work of mass murders. The SS troops himself took a Luciferian oath at midnight. They were bound to Satanists. It was a Satanist organization, but within it were planted groups of Jesuits to be the secret police of the SS police, you see. Many people don't realize how close Catholicism and the occult really are. These men were totally possessed Nothing can stop them, and even today they're still at work in this world. There's quite an international Nazi conspiracy moving today. In the little book Smoke Screens from Chick Publication, there's some choice quotations. Hitler was ready to discuss with the bishop the Jewish question, as for the Jews I am just carrying on with the same policy which the Catholic Church has adopted for 1,500 years. Isn't that something? So when you look at those concentration camps, you see the fulfillment of this from Franz von Papen. He said, the Third Reich is the first world power which not only acknowledges but also puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. So when we look at these people, the uh, Sabbath keepers torn from their homes, their families, placed in concentration camps, you're seeing a view of yourself in the future, friends. Now, uh, the uh, one who signed the Concordat with Hitler was terrified. He had been made Secretary of State and Secretary to the Pope, and he found out that the Pope was going to make an announcement condemning Hitler and Mussolini. Both of those men were terrified by it because they knew the populace looked up to the Pope and their power depended on Catholicism. And somehow that Pope was poisoned 48 hours before he could, uh, uh, Pius XI. And who should become the next Pope? Pius XII, his secretary that signed the Concordat with Hitler. He was silent about the concentration camps and although the Vatican kept a thousand uh, Jews safe underneath the Vatican in case uh, Hitler lost so they could say they protected the Jews, they were in fact supporting this terrible slaughter. In Croatia, I think the most dynamic example of what will happen when the papacy takes control took place. Ante Pavlak was the Hitler of, uh, of Croatia there in this... Uh, this uh, country, they put Franciscan monks into uniform. These monks went out among the populace who were, who were orthodox people who didn't want to be Catholics. They followed another head. And these monks tortured those people. Tortures more horrible than even the concentration camps as they tore people's eyes out and did terrible, cruel things with knives, spoons, and forks. Entered homes and killed whole families, walked into churches and made relatives eat the bodies of their own family. And you cannot imagine that this was 1941, 1942. This was in a modern age. And scenes more horrible than even many of the scenes in the Dark Ages took place as soon as the Roman Church gained control of a government. Brethren, these are what we have to, to unite with Christ for. We have to see that we have to realize that death is a privilege for Christ and give everything to Him. And we need to have compassion on these people. Many of them do not know what they're facing, and we know it. And they're going to be pointing to us one of these days. You knew. In the United States, after the Second World War, this man who was uh, from uh, families that went clear back to the time of the early conspiracies, he ordered the placing of the reverse of the seal on the dollar bill. And that's how it came to be there today on the American dollar. But it's interesting, when you look at this seal, you realize that somehow, secretly behind this government that has lamb-like horns, there is a power that speaks as a dragon before the world. The reverse of the seal of the United States of America, according to Manley P. Hall, an expert on Masonic lore, not only were many of the founders of the U.S. government Masons, but they received aid.
from a secret and august body existing in Europe which helped them to establish the United States for a peculiar and particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The seal, says Hall, was the signature of this exalted body and the unfinished pyramid on its reverse side is a trestle board setting forth symbolically the task to the accomplishment of which the U.S. government was dedicated from the day of its inception. There's a reason why the U.S. is the, uh, the battleground the main battleground of the forces of good and evil at the end of time which is going to affect every country of the world. Many of these men who were responsible for the establishment of our government were leading Masons. After the Second World War, there was a union formed with the Western world, the, Vatic uh, the Vatican-Washington Alliance. At this point in time, the Catholic Church wanted to destroy its rival communism. And uh, so it... It was its goal, and I believe on the surface they want a war, and I think they work on both sides. They want this war, they'll raise up one side and then the other. But through Cardinal Spellman and the Dulce brothers in the United States, they had a control over our government during the Cold War. They hoped to get a hot war go going, and it's, it's basically as a result of their activity that we entered into a hot war in Korea. But this was the communist blueprint for the use of that organ, the United Nations, it was established in the U.S. after the Second World War, to consolidate total working control of the United Nations into communist hands as rapidly as possible, and it's in those hands today. The, the Use the United Nations to break up the colonial territories of the non-communist countries. Use the United Nations as a vehicle for subversion espionage and propaganda with the non-communist member nations. Induce the non-communist member nations to abandon any strong independent foreign policy of their own by turning over this function to the United Nations. Maneuver the non-communist member nations into establishing socialism at home as a necessary transition stage to communism and to become uh, dependent economically on the overall international socialist control and direction of the UN. Induce the stronger non-communist member nations to transfer full control of their military forces to the United Nations. After this, no resistance will be possible. The world will be communist. And in Korea, we fought and we died under the UN flag while the one who was Secretary of Disarmament and Defense in the United Nations, who was a communist, was relieved from that position at that time and went and directed the warfare in North Korea. It's a ridiculous situation. But there's a whole other side of the United Nations, and it's monopolized by these satanic agencies. At Yalta, we, we got a view of the result of the mechanisms going on behind the scenes in politics when these men, Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill, met there and they gave half of the world, the largest part of Europe, to Hitler, I mean to, to Stalin. They cut it in half and I have wept. I stood in that museum at Checkpoint Charlie and I looked at these uh, ex exhibits of the people who tried to get over that wall, tried to get back to their relatives, who tried to get to freedom and the people that have been shot, little children destroyed, people who tried to get over in balloons and run the fence and jump out windows, and I just wept. I just wept. Once, one situation, they allowed relatives to look out of a window and see their relatives, they, or, or through a wall. They opened up part of the wall so they could see their relatives a the distance. And you just see these people with men standing between with guns, and the people are just weeping. They want to go back to their family, and they can't do it. The U.S. was responsible for that, and I hate to say it, not the U.S. that I love and that, that I believe in, but the U.S. that is taking control. I need to stop here for a few moments while I change the video. <laughs> Stalin was well aware of the Roman Catholic influence in the Communist Revolution. He was aware that the Jesuits had come in and had been the ones to basically lay it out in this monstrous thing. He knew that uh, he had to change the direction of the Vatican or a holocaust was going to take uh, apart. Communist world would be destroyed before they had the ability to build up a military safeguard. And so he got a dossier on the different popes and through his influences, the influence of the communist Catholics, they were able to get the first communist pope in in history, John the 23rd. John immediately began these Vatican II meetings were to uh, soften the anti-communist stand in the world and soften the anti-Protestant feelings. Uh, join everybody, that was the goal. Join them and paralyze them from within. And unfortunately, the whole world at that time was caught up with the ecumenical feelings and the movement. 
Testament. It's during those years that even we as a people compromised terribly. And uh, I think that, you know, honest men may have done it, but unfortunately uh, they were influenced. The next pope was called the Pink Pope because he was so communist. His name was Montini. He became Pope Paul VI. And uh, here he is with that 666 symbol. They always depict these guys with the Jesuit uh, bowing down to them. It's all a big facade, a big facade. One Jesuit priest actually made it during those years into the White House. His name was John F. Kennedy. And uh, years later, I read it in uh, one of the newspapers. I wish I had it with me here, that uh, one man who was running for office mentioned his fellow Jesuit, John F. Kennedy. And so I believe that they believed that through this man they would gain control of the world. When that man turned against his oath, he was butchered. No doubt about it. Catholic Power Today, again, we read that the Catholic Church offer for reunion to all Christian churches not in communion with her is a magnificent ecclesiastical Trojan horse, a means to penetrate their citadels and accomplish their capture and final capitulation. These are Catholic priests all speaking in tongues. They captured the Pentecostals through tongues. They captured the Adventists by in Vatican II, re-sanctifying the Seventh-day Sabbath. And I, uh, uh, Alberto Rivera mentioned to me that the Catholic Church is a real surprise for you uh, Adventists. They're going to promote Saturday at the end of time. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. We could talk about that later in question and answer. This charismatic movement did not begin really with the Protestants if a person realizes the influence behind it. This is the town of Port Glasgow, Scotland. In this little town, there was a family uh, that was deeply involved with a splinter group called the Campbellites at that time. And uh, they were part of Edward Irving's church. And I asked Alberto about Edward Irving as these men were directed by Jesuits in the work that they were doing in England. But this such sect attracted many people in the west of Scotland. Prominent in the movement was James George MacDonald, shipbuilders in the east end of the town. They lived with their three sisters, one of whom was an invalid. Now the MacDonalds were acquainted with the Campbell family, small farmers living in Fernicary in the parish of Rosneath, who had become prominent in this religious movement. So we're looking at a religious movement that is largely influenced by a man named Edward Irving, which is influenced by the Jesuits himself. And this is how they work. They're behind the scenes. One of the daughters was Isabella, had died of pulmonary tuberculosis. She seems to have been quite a genuine mystic. The town earlier had been ravished by witchcraft. Her younger sister, Mary, who became well-known in the religious world, suffered from the same disease and was confined to bed. She was the first, apparently, to give exhibitions of the gift of tongues, uh, and many inquirers had, had visited her. She was the first one with this gift of tongues. When she spoke, she says that these are the, uh, this is a tongue of, of some islanders, you see. Oh, and one time she said, uh, one of the languages has often, she often conceived to be Turkish. One of these she spoke in my presence, she cried out, uh, she knew to be the language of the Palu Islanders, you see. But uh, linguists checked her out. There was no language she was speaking. It was total gibberish. But through her tongue's experience, she seconded the teachings of John Darby and Edward Irving, who said that Christ was to come in the future in a rapture. And I believe that that was a continuation of the Jesuit conspiracy established way back at the Council of Trent when Linez and... Um, or not Lyness, but uh, Alcazar and Ribera were directed to create alternate prophecies to make the uh, Antichrist appear to come way back at the time of Nero or way in the future. And this was a continuation of the futurist reapplication of prophecy view. And I hate to see our people following in this path today because the Jesuits are behind that. This book written called The Rapture, a Catholic view of latter days and the second coming was written by Catholic priests. Uh, the denominations have been influenced terribly by the Vatican movement for ecum ecumenism. And we see today over and over again a union of Catholicism and Protestants. And this happened before in history and the Protestants were slaughtered as a result. I just don't like what's happening today. This man years ago when he spoke out on cults, this is Walter Martin, uh, he pointed out Catholicism was a cult. And today he won't say anything about it. I asked him in a meeting, you know, I said, I said, why don't you speak out on the biggest cult of them all? Roman Catholicism. He said, Roman Catholicism is not a cult. It's a Christian church. 
And I believe the man is influenced again, and we can see people crumbling under this overwhelming mountain of, of, of influence behind the scenes. The Catholic Power Today by Avro Manhattan makes it clear that the first thing the church tries to do is support any military or economic political force interested in retaining the way things are while they're in control so as to crush her contemporary paramount religious or ideological opponents. Then, if that doesn't work, she mobilizes all her religious, diplomatic, and political might, everything she can, to counterattack such an opponent, opponent if she fails to crush it. She'll start a, a movement to constantly be undermining her opponent and condemning it. If that doesn't work, and the third stage and the last stage and final is this, form an alliance with it characterized by joining it in special circumstances leading it the aims of her seeming surrender being to slow down capture and paralyze the enemy in order by ensuring ultimate control from within to stop its advance and ensure her final advancement when pope paul started traveling around this whole world it was the first time a pope did this he kissed the feet of the orthodox priest then it had been uh, it had been almost a thousand years of separation and now we see these two churches working together with the Orthodox Church dependent upon the Catholic Church to sustain her position in the East now. The Vatican uh, doors were opened up and the communist leaders were invited in while the door was closed to the United States. The Pope presented himself as the, the God of the people, the Pope of the proletariat and Jesus was promoted as Lenin with long hair and a beard. Now, the Jesuits during these years were very active, but the image they were putting out in the liberal press is that they just didn't know what to do with themselves anymore, you know? I mean, the old dark ages when they were established is a long time ago. Now they're kind of looking for a new identity. The poor fellows don't know what to do. Why don't they go home and raise families and become decent citizens then, you know? But no, they were being graduated by the thousands. They were taking their oaths. They were going to every level of society. Nixon's aide, McLaughlin, who wrote his speeches, was a Jesuit, just like today. The man who writes the uh, speeches for Reagan is a Jesuit, and that's come out in the public press. Movie actors were Jesuits. Now, Congressman Drennan is a Jesuit. And still, Jesuits were following the path of Matteo Ricci and uh, Nobili. Here, here we see Jesuits with this hybrid of Hinduism and Catholicism still out there working in India and in the Orient. Other Jesuits have become uh, counselors to presidents, such as John D. McCollum. And this man here actually counseled with Nixon. It was largely due from, from the book that I have on him, due to his, his counsel uh, to bomb Cambodia. And if you ever realize what happened there, that was to ensure that the Khmer Rouge would come over. It was a terrible thing that happened. Five million people destroyed out of a country of seven million people. Well, it was a terrible thing. But still, the Jesuits grow in power. I dialed the number 6666666, and I got this place in San Francisco. The University of San Francisco is a Jesuit university, and there the great chapel of Loyola is there. The young men are raised up very different from other orders. They're raised to be healthy. They're raised to, to, to be robust in health for the strength and stamina of the kind of work that they're going to have to face. Behind the scenes, something ominous is rising. I'm going to read you quotations uh, uh, I have on some of these things later, if there's time. But... Um, J. Edgar Hoover made it clear that the Negro situation is being exploited fully and continuously by the communists on a national scale. Current programs include intensified attempts to infiltrate mass organization. The party's objectives are to aid the Negroes, but are, are not to aid the Negroes, but designed to take advantage of an all-out controversial issues on race question in the minds of the American people. And then it goes on to say here, another quotation, the communists are deliberately maneuvering among the Negroes to create a situation for the outbreak of racial violence to such an extent that it can be turned into a civil war and a civil war on a racial basis. It sounds just like quotations from the spirit of prophecy on this. In such a civil war, should they succeed in fomenting it, the communists hope to so undermine the American government and our social structure that they can take over power. In the racial civil war they envisage, they are sure the Negroes will be in the front ranks of shock troops of the communist revolution. Ella White says the army will be called out, the movement will be crushed, and these folks will be put back into slavery and a Sunday law will come in with it. That's exactly what she says. And so when we see the communists publishing this book, calling for the Negroes to rise up in the South and make their own country in the South where they'll be her heralded as more prominent citizens, you can see this working, going on, working. Here in one of the schools in the South, over there, there's a communist classroom. You see Martin, uh, not, his name was really Michael. 
Michael Luther King, but they've given him the name of Martin after Martin Luther, you see. But, uh, but you see these men rising, like Malcolm X, who was assassinated. Both of these men were assassinated. The purpose of that is to make, make martyrs out of them. Now, you, you have these men trained to be communist leaders. They learn how to work in pa passive movements at first. But those passive movements bring the people's minds deeply into the issue emotionally. And then radical groups join and create the violence, you see. But the communists start in peaceful ways first. They appear to be the great humanitarians and uh, appear to be doing good things. So if you speak out against it, you know, you're a fool. But the result's always the same. I'll tell you, this situation in South Africa is going to turn into one of the biggest bloodbaths in history. I can promise you that. The government doesn't realize what's happening to them. They think, oh, this propaganda from the West is just the communists, fool just the communists fooling around. They should open their eyes and see that almost every country of Africa has fallen to the communists. Their guns aren't going to help them against a propaganda campaign that they cannot fight. The U.S. is starting to, to bring out sanctions against them. And I'll tell you, it's going to be a worldwide thing before it's over with. Is it on 80? Okay, all set to go then. Here he is at the Freedom Festivals in, uh, in the U.S. And behind him, Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte, both men were brought before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. They were card-holding communists from Hollywood. Okay, there we go. I was approached by a man who, uh, who asked me some questions. He says, why in the world are the blacks down in Richmond uh, hoarding automatic weapons in a garage just down the street from my house? I saw a van. I'll try one more there. Is it stuck? Okay, black teenagers without jobs, time bombs for the U.S. Black on black violence is a plague throughout the country. And when we look at, at Africa, we're seeing a portent, really, for a lot of the violence that is to come upon us. And how is the church handling it? Well, she has the Ethiopian section of the Pontifical Gregorian University training young black people to take over the positions in the church in Africa so that when the Pope came back to the United States on this last trip, he said... Catholicism in Africa is Africa. And the violence that's there, believe me, is largely due to the Roman Church and the Jesuit order. This man was only in for 33 days. He was brought in by the, Rome, the, the communists, but the fear that Moscow was dominating the church uh, took over. Within 33 days, he was poisoned. And the CIA was deeply involved in this activity along with those uh, Catholics who are interested in realigning themselves with the Western world. And it's a very sad thing to see this to happen. The man that they chose for the job was a man who was trained to be an actor, a dramatist, a man who had written plays, and also a man who had a degree in philosophy. This man's name was Karl Wotilla. He became John Paul II, and his work was to continue the work of Vatican II, which will result in a world Roman Catholic Socialist empire. The world almost worships this man. It's hard to believe. Here's a man that's an actor, like the President of the United States. But it is too delicate a situation to put, uh, to put anyone else in than someone who can just carry out orders. But when we look at the, the event that took place in the communist world, we can see that the communists know by watching Solidarity, the power of Roman Catholicism, they're terrified of her too. When she came to the United States, 14,000 journalists were accredited to cover it. It was a multi-billion dollar project. He dropped off the plane to his knees and kissed the ground of the United States, which they claim they own and they will win back. When he went across the country, no human being has ever gathered such crowds as this man in a Protestant country. This says here, Protestants for the Pope. Where are the Protestants today? Paul, hand, uh, John Paul, keep your hands off my body, this woman says. Everybody rises up. Everyone's eyes are on the Pope today. And a Protestant Paris, uh, president reached his hands across the Gulf and joined the hands of Catholicism and invited him to do his mass on the White House lawn. This cursed our country, and it's the beginning of national apostasy, which is to be followed by national ruin.
As, as he came to the United Nations and spoke before this, the, the people, it made it clear that he was trying to raise up the third world countries. The Pope aligned himself in spirit with the demands of the developing nations for restructuring the world economic order. During the 62-minute discourse of the General Assembly, the Pope shed, as it were, his clerical garb and displayed his humanistic side. He interposed his carefully chosen words with patently Marxist egalitarian themes. He again, like like Paul is the working man's Pope, the working man's Messiah. And as he's gone from one country to another, his acting ability, his speaking ability has been revealed as he adapts himself to each one. Guess what color Jesus turned when he went to Africa? A black God and a black church. And I believe that the climax of this thing, taking over Africa, one of the hotbeds of violence in the world today, spreading it to other countries, is that the Pope may one day be a black man. John Paul completes his team. In a major reshuffle, it says that uh, he has promoted this man, Gantin, to one of the three most important posts in the Vatican. And it has been long believed that, uh, that the plan has been to place a black man as pope so the third world country, the largest, uh, uh, the largest area of the human family, will look to the Vatican. She'll have a hold on the communist world. She'll have a hold on the Western world. And then she'll have uh, a black man in there so the, the rest of the world will see that this is our church, you see. But this situation in black Africa is definitely going to result in... A dangerous situation. Central America just torn apart by violence. They found nuns and, and uh, priests right with guns in their hands fighting right along against the, uh, the army that's there. When the Pope came, he did more to discourage those peoples and create a feeling of anger and revolution. Here you see uh, one of the rallies in Central America. It says Juan Pablo, uh, Juan Pablo, uh, see, Benvenido, uh, Nicaragua Libre. Benvenido. How many read Spanish here? Okay. Gracias a Dios. Thank you, God. A la revolución and the revolution. Thank you, God and the revolution. Oh, okay. Uh, Juan Paul, Benvenido, welcome uh, to uh, a Nicaragua Libre. Free Nicaragua. Juan Paul, welcome to Free Nicaragua, government controlled by the Jesuits, you see. Thank you, God, and the revolution. You can see that, that somehow Marxism and Catholicism have united. The spirit of these biblical Marxist, Lenin's oriented quotations have already impregnated the whole fabric of Latin America, church from Tierra del Fuego to the borders of the U.S. Scattered all along the continent, there are undetermined battalions of, uh, battalions of missionary priests, nuns, lay workers, preaching and practicing a combination of the tenets of liberation theology. Uh, Marxism, Catholicism, Marxism and Catholicism of uh, Paul, uh, Pope John Paul II. Their battalions are increasing at ever accelerated pace. Their precise numbers is anybody's guess, but to judge by what is already known, the portents are terrifying. By early 1982, there were already more than 53 to 54,000 basic liberated, liberation communities in Brazil alone. Individual Jesuits have time acknowledged their involvement in the revolution. Father Luis Palacer, for instance, when he testified in San Salvador December 12, 1981, before an audience of diplomats and newsmen, admitted that he had served in active guerrilla group for almost 15 years. He stated that he had joined the guerrillas in Guatemala, and from there, he had helped to prepare the ground for guerrillas in El Salvador. Every Jesuit, he says, in Central America is actively serving not God, but Marxism and revolution. And this is all over. This is the center of the Waldensian world today. I spent three days there, and all night long I heard communist chants, communist marches, communist music. People from all over, many of them were Protestants and Catholics together, joined together in this celebration of Il Unita, the Union, and Marxist symbols all over the place. Things are changing in our world, and we can't afford to keep our head in the sand. Why forgive? Why forgive? I just have documentation in the other room that the papacy is in a direct league with the leaders of the fundamental Shiite movement, if not controlling it from the Vatican. And so this imagery of the Pope forgiving this, uh, this man here is very, very interesting at this time. Don't think that Catholicism and Muslim religion cannot get along. It will if it wants to. But we see one of the great dangers to the U.S. now 
is the situation in the Middle East. And nothing's going to stop that. It will bear the, the work that these men have planned that it should do. The people are afraid today of atomic warfare. And the, the key to religious union is this movement for peace. It's when they cry peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. We are living in the last moments of Earth's history. That Pope is always in the hot spots, whether it be sol sol solidarity or whether it be this Palestinian character or right there in England where for years they were at odds. Now it appears they're working together. It's a frightening situation. And, and we can't afford to lower our colors at this time. Everywhere you look, originally the Opus Dei was presented as a group fighting communism, but today the church appears to be joining communism and it's coming out in the public magazines. And when presidents of the United States see the power of Rome, it can sway the balance of power any way it, it wants, they realize that the mother is riding upon the nations and they better do what she says. There's a hotline between the Vatican and the United States government and whatever policies given by the government have to be carried out by the Vatican, have to be carried out over and above the legislative bodies of the people. And this is why the Catholic Church is the largest church in the United States of America. Ecclesiastically, she is the best organized financially. She is on a par with any of the giant trusts or corporations of America. Indeed, should the occasion arise, she could stand up to all of them collectively. Politically, she is looming ever larger at the White House. She is a power in the Senate, a force at the Pentagon, an invisible agent at the FBI, and the most subtle, intangible prime mover of the wheel within a wheel of the United States, the Central Intelligence Agency. You see, they don't just want to take over because they'll blame for it for all history. They want the Protestants to do it for them. When you get a view in the last few years, just the last few years of the rise of Catholicism, it is shot up. It is, there are, uh, right now, this, had, this was just a couple years ago, 21%, it says. Now it's 25%. And it's growing by leaps and bounds. There's almost a billion people in this world that now are in the Roman Catholic camp. When the U.S. and the Vatican formed the link, it was a shock to the United States. The Protestant societies in the U.S. rose up against it, but nothing passed the common people. They had nothing to say about it, and this country joined with the Vatican. It says, the step announced here and at the Vatican was described by the officials of the Reagan administration as an attempt to improve communication at a time when Pope John Paul II had become increasingly involved in international affairs. It hadn't happened since 117 years. Why? Because at the time of the war between the states, it was a religious war against Catholicism, one, and also Italy was torn apart by Mazzini's uh, revolution against Catholicism, and ties were broken at that time. But when you look at what they're doing to the Protestants, they're forcing the Protestant world into legislation so that the Sunday law can come through. Now they're coming out in our public magazines. Now they're saying, the Catholics are saying, let's have a Sunday law. Reagan ordered concentration camps a year ago. These concentration camps were the purpose, he said, of taking care of these tax, uh, these men who are trying to get out of tax and those who are trying to get out of the draft. But it had another purpose, these concentration camps. It says, but these sources say Rex 84 has another even more closely guarded and carefully orchestrated object to apply so-called uh, capture and custody measures against political opponents, resistors, or even outspoken critics whom the administration considers dangerous. And when you look at how they've been handling this kind of thing. This group was called MOVE. It looks just like a war zone. They said, oh, it was just a little accident. We dropped a bomb and things got out of control. They destroyed a whole city block just to get one little group that was in a room in one house. When we see the Pope and the President and the President of the United States uh, agreeing to work with the Roman Catholic Church in World Projects for Peace, then you can see that anyone that speaks out against the papacy can come under the heading of speaking out against the administration in the future. Let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed and Rome be reinstated in her former power and there would speedily be a revival of her former tyranny of persecution. Just remember what happened in Croatia under the Eustaches. The Protestant church are in great darkness or they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution and to undo all that Protestantism has done. And this is almost word for word what Alberto Rivera said she was planning to do. Uh, I, I just talked to her not long ago, him not long ago. 
She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in the past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints to the Most High. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose, but beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. We have something better than Alberto Rivera. Oh, everyone's looking at Alberto. No, come on. We have a prophet of God that has revealed more than that man could reveal because God knows more than that man could know. The serpent is still alive and well today. It rules behind the Vatican and other great powers such as the Illuminati that are working to destroy this country. And the Jesuits... Well, when they came back into power in the 19th century, in 1814, about there, immediately they went into the sciences. They went into education. They pushed their men into the sciences. And today, many Jesuits are leading out in the space programs and other organizations that are right at the forefront that are changing the future of society today. They know what they're doing and where they're going. The facade is that the Roman church has now worked out its difference with the Jesuits. But the fact, are, the fact is that the Jesuits are in a death grip to destroy the Roman church and set up a Luciferian world. When we look at these churches all across the, the world, and Ellen White tells us that in the recesses of these churches are still instruments of torture that are to be used again. Believe it, brethren. Believe it. And I believe those are used even today as the Inquisition has never closed its doors. They said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, set a seal on the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the land. Only those that are doing the work and giving the message are sealed at the end of time. Whosoever transgresses that abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, he does not have God with him. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, don't let him into your place of worship. Do not allow it. Speak out against it. I don't care what you have to do. Speak out against it. Your eternal life is weighed in what you do right now. You've got to stand on the Lord's side, friends. This crisis isn't going to get better. It's going to get worse. And God, like Elijah, is standing up saying, who is on the Lord's side? Who is on the Lord's side? One sin above another that God hates is treason at this time in the midst of a crisis. And this message is coming to every heart as Christ knocks on each individual life today. Friends, we've got to call the people home. We've got to call them home. Let's bow our heads and end this part of the program. Dear Lord in heaven, our loving and kind God, I ask, Lord, that you'll be with each soul here I know, Father, that these things are, are not popular. I know that there's probably half the people that usually come to these meetings this weekend. And, Father, my heart aches because of that. I beg you, Lord, that somehow through the videos and through these dear souls that this word will get out all over Australia and the people will wake up to the times in which we live and stand for God. Though the heavens uh, may fall around them, no matter what people say, they'll stand true. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.